I'm Mike Weir, Chief Revenue Officer at G2, the world's largest and most trusted software marketplace. And welcome to Go to Market Innovators, the series where we sit down with B2B revenue and marketing leaders to learn about the successes they've had, the challenges they've faced, and how they've used technology to create an aligned sales and marketing organization to drive their businesses forward. The first guest joining us today is Sangram Vajra. He is the CEO and co-founder of GoToMarket Partners. It's a data-driven analyst firm. Sangram has some really unique experience that I'm excited to get into. You know, he's an expert in go-to-market. He ran the marketing at Pardot, uh, acquired by Exact Target, and then Exact Target was acquired by Salesforce for a lot of money uh, before he became the co-founder of Terminus which helped pioneer a lot of the ABM platform technology that many of the go-to-market operators listening today will be very familiar with. He's also the author of three different go-to-market books. So Sangram, welcome and can't wait to get into some of the great insights you have. Let's do it. Being the first is like such an honor and pressure like this. Uh, either I'm going to set the bar so low that anybody can top it or let's see where it goes. Yeah, you, your choice. Go high, go low. Either way, we'll we'll pioneer forward. Yeah. So, I think the uh, Sangram. One of the really great things is that the vantage point that you bring for the other go-to-market operators, the CMOs, the CROs that are going to be listening in. You know, how do you think that a CEO perspective and mindset can inform the way that go-to-market operators should be thinking? Yeah. Well, the first and foremost, I think in the whole world of go-to-market, especially marketing as being the facilitator of a lot of these conversations, it has just been boring to boring. Like I think in many ways, B2B has nothing but boring to boring. The bar is super low on that side. And I think we all need to aspire to become better to better. So each one of us, if we could say and look at everything we do, just close our eyes and do an audit of everything that we're doing in our organization, do you feel excited about it? Like, oh, wow, we wrote three blog posts. We put two uh, different tweets. And, and is that exciting? And, and if that's not, then that's boring to boring. That's you doing everything that everybody wants versus it's like better. Yeah, we changed the game. We, we reimagine certain things that happen in the marketplace. And that's better to better. And I feel that's where the market is heading. And best companies that go to market are going to do that. I couldn't agree more. I think that as somebody who is marketed to, I would prefer to be engaged with. I would prefer to be semi-entertained as well. So, uh, you know, really looking forward to, to getting into the ideas that you've shared as we've as we've gotten to know each other, as we've worked together uh, in different capacities. You know, you shared a very enlightening story about valuation and how to think about business metrics differently. Could you elaborate on that for everybody? Absolutely. This is uh, this is just walk with me in here, Mike. And you have been in board meetings, so you know how these goes. Uh, I was in a board meeting, and there was the CEO of this company who was really, really upset because he said, "You know, I don't understand this." And yeah, we were like, "Yeah, let's talk about this. What's going on?" And he's like, "Look, my company is a thirty-five. Uh, my, sorry, my company is a fifty million dollar uh, ARR company." And I see that this company, which is a competitor of, uh, of us, is a $35 million. Their valuation is over $2 billion, And our valuation is half a billion. I don't get it. That's 35 or 50. What's wrong? And we're sitting there in the board meeting and we're like, you know, we obviously know the answer. He also kind of knew the answer, but he was genuinely frustrated. And, and Mike, who wouldn't, right? I mean, it, it's hard to get to that 50 mark. And he was, he was going for it. And it came down to like, well, what is your NRR? What is your net revenue retention? And when it comes down to the $35 million company, the meeting that we were in, they only had 75% NRR. Mm -hmm. Whereas the company that was 35 million, which is lower by 15 million ARR, their net revenue retention was 120%. In, 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 if you, if you want to just data nerd on this one and pull up your spreadsheet and see what that means, it means that the other company that is 35 million in revenue, because they have 120% net revenue retention NRR, they can grow, they can double every five years without even adding a customer at zero customers. They can double their revenue. While as this company, which is at 50 million ARR, because their net revenue retention NRR is 75, 
they will have to grow three to five times just to keep and, 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 and build their company because it's going to be a leaky bucket. That's the problem that we're left with. The growth at all costs is so far off uh, in the marketplace that we all have to come back to the basics that what really matters is how do we grow efficiently. And that's really the challenge that we all are facing right now. Yeah, I would agree, especially in the times that we sit in right now with the global economy where it's at, that makes tremendous sense. But how much are folks like CMOs, CROs, how much are they thinking about it? in that way. And, you know, what's your experience? Cause you're out there, you know, running workshops, you're out there speaking at events. Like, yeah. You know, do you think this is commonplace? Uh, this is a great question, Mike. Uh, we have been doing uh, a road show, as you said, like we're we going on a six city road show. We're going to be in, uh, we've been in Atlanta, DC, SF, Seattle, uh, we're going to go to Toronto and Chicago. We're going to come down where, where G2 is uh, in about in April. What, what's interesting about it is that every time I will ask this in a room of 75 to 100 go-to-market executives, these are CMOs, CROs, CEOs sitting in the room. These are all go-to-market executives. That's what our roadshow caters to. They, they are decision makers. They're go-to-market leaders. And when, when I ask them, how many of you, raise your hand, how many of you were thinking about NRR as your core metric five mm -hmm. years ago? No hands go up. None. And then I'm, I'm in the same boat. I'm not like poo-pooing on other people. I have been a co-founder of a company, Termis. I have run marketing and we were sold to a publicly traded company. But NRR, even though it was in the back end, it never really became the number one metric that mattered. So I said, well, well, how about two years ago? Still no hands really went up because we, everybody was still trying to hold on to what it is. It's really in the last six months mm -hmm. to eight months or last year, 2022 was the first year where I remember Yamini Rungan, the CEO of HubSpot at her inbound, at their inbound conference publicly said, and I remember in a podcast interview that I had with her, she but I asked her, what is the one metric that you care as a publicly traded SaaS company out there? And she said, NRR without blinking an eye. And I'm like, I thought it was going to be a trick question for you. Like I thought you would say, there's no one metric. She's like, no, no, it's really, really important for everybody to understand that this is not a made up metric. This is not something that you come up with. This is actually how great businesses that you don't really hear on uh, out there making noise, but great businesses, the foundation, the fundamentals is on it. And it's unfortunate that in that room, when we do the roadshow, uh, almost six to eight months ago, until that time, nobody really talked about NRR as a key metric in their business. Yeah. And the part that I love about what you just said is a publicly traded company is thinking in this way. Yeah. Because we, you know, for those that have been in the startup world, like we know that most startups think about net retention because most venture capitalists care about net retention. But it's it's both private, yeah. public. At the end of the day, this is about efficiency and this is about smart growth. And so I, I think that's a really interesting one that we want to explore a little bit more because smart growth, that efficient growth, not easy. Yeah. But it's possible. And it's one of the key things that you all talk about on a regular basis. Yeah. So when you think about those efficiency metrics, you know, you've told me in the past about two key ways that you're evangelizing for folks to build yeah. a smarter growth, event led and community led growth. Yep. And that you believe that they're highly underutilized techniques today. Yeah. Can you share, you know, why are these techniques so valuable to CROs and CMOs in creating an aligned go to market, but ultimately building a really efficient growth engine? Well, the first and foremost, Mike, I think this is an area where I wish if people are driving around or anything, just Take, take a moment, maybe go back and listen to it and, and take a pen and paper and write this down because I wish somebody would have told me that like seven years ago and I would have applied those things. So this is more of battle scars that come into life into, into this conversation. Um, and on go-to-market partners, we have the seven go-to-market motions. And I bring that up because we have done tons of surveys or a thousand people surveys with go-to-market leaders. And what we have found is most successful companies have more than one, if not two, go-to-market motions running. Now, let me repeat that more than, if not just one, but more than two or three go to market motions. For example, I'll just share with you all the seven and we'll dive into these two. We it's in most people think about inbound outbound as the most standard ones, right? Like everybody got a sales machine or engine or inbound. We think about that, but 
how many people are getting asked like, hey, what is your PLG motion? Now, all of a sudden, all of us who have been doing this for the last 20 years, we're like, what? What are you talking about? I thought we knew what we were doing. And now PLG is a new thing. Then events, we look at Dreamforce and, and Gainsight and all of these uh, big events and say, you know, what, what are these people doing? Well, they're creating event-led growth. They're using that as a forcing function to bring new product innovation, bring their uh, market leaders together. You also see ecosystem left, like what is, what's happening? The marketplace that Dreamforce and Salesforce have created, that is an ecosystem led. There's partner led, there's community led. So there are multiple different go to market mm -hmm. motions that companies to consider when they're trying to create efficient growth. So the two that you and I talked about, I think are absolutely critical, especially in 2023, event led and community led. Let's talk about event led. Um, our data with G2 partnership showed that about 2021, post pandemic, what hit up, and if you look at G2 data, it's phenomenal, where you can see a direct spike in everybody looking for, all right, we can do physical events. What do we do? Where do we pay? Like people are literally searching for intent data and signals through G2 to figure out where do we pay? And all of a sudden you saw this massive spike on all the companies like Goldcast and Airmead that created new experiences for people to experience webinars right? Like the, the conversation that we're all so used to using Zoom. Like how do you experience conversation that is second to one-to-one -to -one in person connection? How do you do that? And therefore event-led growth has exploded. Event-led platforms have exploded. Um, and one of the best ways we do is through the roadshow by having people come in a small, intimate way and talk about challenges. And it's almost like a therapy session. People want to be part of that. So that's event-led. Um, and the second part is community-led. Everywhere communities have, have been out, right? Most people are probably familiar with Pavilion out there that does a great job at it. Uh, there's Peak Community that I'm part of that is, does a great job of it for marketers. And all these communities are creating a safe place where people can interact and talk about the challenges they're having. Both of these places are breeding grounds for creating incredible efficient growth because people want to do business with people who you trust. And if you can be in the same environment through events or through community, and you feel like, oh, they understand my problem, I can trust them and I can do business with them, boom, that's where magic is happening. So I think more companies need to lean in to specifically these two uh, areas of go-to-market motions, because that is one of the most understated, and undervalued go-to-market motions. Yeah, I think uh, as I'm hearing you talk through this, one thing that resonates as you, as you talked about you know, net revenue retention as a key driver of that growth plan. Event-led, community-led, it's all about rallying around your customer. Yes. About helping them be successful. And so it makes total sense. And I'm really curious to explore a little bit deeper in the ideas that, that we want to bring forward to help go-to-market operators be really successful is that technology plays a key role. Yeah. In, in how people can do these type of approaches better today than ever before. And so you mentioned a couple of company names in there. What I'd love to get from you is like, what role do you see and what specific types of technologies yeah. do you see now that a CMO or a CRO should be thinking about to help make an event-led or a community-led strategy even better than maybe what they tried five, 10 years ago? Oh, that's, a, that's a great question. I, I think people definitely should look at companies like Goldcast and Airmead because they are the type of companies that are really challenging the status quo of conversations that needs to happen mm. that are next to in-person uh, things. But what also is interesting about are there other companies that are rising up right now on the community-led side, and they're just simply... Uh, not, you, you wouldn't imagine them to be an actual company. So, for example, Mighty Networks, uh, they are doing an incredible job of creating communities for creators. And so in every organization right now, you're seeing, I'm seeing the rise of hiring evangelists right now. In every company, people are hiring, hey, can we hire an evangelist who can talk about the problem, not the product? Mm -hmm. Very interesting proposition when you think about investing in something. And I've been there myself, so I know it's really hard to show ROI of your evangelism in, the, in a, a, a typical funnel mode that everybody's used to looking at ROI. So I'm seeing companies hire evangelists whose full-time job is to evangelize 
the category, the problem. And instead of saying that, hey, go and stay and talk about our product every day, they're actually part of building a community around them, around that problem and evangelizing them, bringing different people to it and having that conversation. That is changing the game because again, we, as we talked about it, it is about having trust. It is about knowing that, oh, you get my problem. So maybe you can help me with the solution. And that trust is what's eroding right now in the marketplace because everybody's so distant and people or everybody says, oh, I have the best company that solves the world's problem. If every company, if, if you look at, I've done this audit, Mike, this is funny. Uh, if you go and look at everybody's boilerplate uh, of what they say about themselves, you would think that the world should have no problem whatsoever. <laughs> Everybody's boilerplate said, says, we are the best company. We solve this problem. We drive 300% revenue growth. If that is true, and if that is true, actually, in fact, why would anybody not be run using your product? Like, obviously, they'd be crazy not to use your product. But the reality is, no, one technology piece doesn't solve all the problem. It is part of the solution, which is why the evangelist role is really so critical. I call those like love letters to yourself. A lot of companies do this. They would write love letters to yourself, which is really the boilerplate saying that we are the best and you should all love us and you should all buy from us. But the reality is no, you want people in the organizations that can really empathize with the problem mm -hmm. and talk about it in a way that your customers understand it and then start solving on it. Yeah. So the technology is helping to extend and create as much access to the conversation as possible in these two growth strategies, right? It's yep. you know, COVID hits, you can't go to live events, you need digital platforms, those pivot into, you know, create an ongoing community experience, not just a point in time event. And so I see how they connect and I, I like the way you're thinking about this. You've mentioned empathy in there. Uh -huh. And I, I do want, to spend a little bit of time on that part, because what, what I hear and the way I use communities that I'm a part of to help me be better, to help me learn about the market, the empathy that resonates with us over at G2 is folks want to learn about the authentic feedback for what doesn't work. Mm. To your point, everybody makes it seem like their product is amazing and they are amazing in most instances, or you go out of business, unfortunately. Yeah. But in a lot of instances, they are amazing, but it's not always perfect for every single business. It may be the company size, maybe the region, like just the support. So that empathy that a community-led strategy can bring, which is let me hear, let me react, let me help solve with you. But what I also was taking from the way you were talking about this is, it's not just on me, the company, like talk to your peers. Yeah. So can you just expand a little bit on that of like how, how are companies, maybe if you have any examples or just even the way you use the communities and the events that you're building out for go-to-market partners to build that dynamic and to listen and help, like can you expand a little bit on, on how do you touch on empathy to help customers want to keep working with you? Yeah, it's, it's such an important point and I hope people recognize that that is what everybody really wants. And remember, um, there was a time when you, we all used to watch on uh, LinkedIn or YouTube where there's this guy who's on his beach house and taking a selfie and saying, hey, I made millions of dollars if you want. Like, here, look at my bank account. Those videos are gone because people are like, no, I want safe. I want security. I want to see, know that this thing works. Like people want to know what, what's behind the other side of that beach house that's had not that we don't see in that camera. Um, so one of the ways we're doing that, and I'll, I'll use, since you asked an example for Go to Market Roadshow, is we have these roadshows where there are about 75 to 100 executives come in. Guess what? It is sponsored by about 20 or so vendors, but there are no booths. So there's not a single booth at mm -hmm. this event. Uh, there is no vendor speaking at this event. The only way we do this is by saying that we are going to have one of your customers present something called as towards the end, TED Talk, Tech Talk. So we, we coined that phrase like TED Talk, Tech Talk, which is a 10 minute talk towards the end on their go to market tech stack. And what is the one use case that you want everybody to know that's helping your business grow efficiently? So what that forces them is no, no good rambling around your, your, your childhood story and anything you really get to towards the end saying, 
this customer would come in and say, all right, hey, look, I'm so-and-so, my company uh, does X, Y, Z. Let me tell you one use case. So people are now hooked to that use case because people have problems that they want to be solved. So the use case could be how they do differently the content experience. The use case, use case could be that, hey, how do we use the RevOps in our organization? The use case uh, could very well be that here's how we connect our data streams uh, with all the intent data. How do we use that to drive exact conversations with the right people? So that allows people to now think about, oh, I have the same use case problem. I didn't know how to do that. So I see this person doing it. And then we ask them to show the, uh, the technology stack they use to solve that problem. And that's when it's clearly that, oh, they're using a combination of sales loft, let's say lean data, Syncari, open price. So now people say, oh, I've never heard about these two technologies. Let me check that out. So it's a it's a open way of showing use case based conversations. It's happening. We do it six of them, ten minutes each for an hour. So it's like a very fast beat conversation. Everybody leaves excited, learning, get to know more, wanting more after the event. So they are connecting and building relationship. But there is no booth. There is no vendor talk. There is no introduction from vendor. There is no sales pitches. There's no SDR AE attending that. It's all executives. So now you're having real authentic conversations and you're doing workshop problem solving and you're seeing technology that can possibly solve your problem. And that's why they all are sponsoring and want to come to that event. Love that. I think we've got time for one last question. So you've talked about event-led and community-led. And if I were to say, okay, those feel like some of the, the bigger challenges that you feel the market faces. There's not enough companies are thinking about using those two strategies today. What's some practical advice that you would give everybody about how to overcome that challenge, how to get started yeah. in event-led and community-led uh, strategies to grow? In, in both cases, Mike, this is one thing that's been common and that's been common, not just for us, but across every single. And I think, I, I hope you would agree with that. Wh wherever you can niche down on a specific mm -hmm. segment or specific persona, that works 10 times better than going broad. Um, so case in point, I remember when COVID hit and I was at, still at Terminus, we didn't know what to do, like just like everybody else. And we realized that everybody is going to have the same challenge. So what we did was we did this 20 people uh, in the same industry, 20 CML conversations, same industry to talk about how they're addressing it. We had three questions for them, a 30 minute uh, facilitated talk on a webinar. This is 2020. And guess what? Every one of them showed up. And we stopped at 20 and they said, no, of course, it's a webinar. More than 20 can show up. I'm like, no, we want this to be a safe environment. We want people to be able to have enough time to talk about it. This is not presentation. We Everybody gets to talk about it. We are not pitching terminus. We're not doing anything. We want you all to have a place where you can talk about our CEO still has saying this, but I don't know what to do. Like have that safe environment. That worked. That was event led. And, and, and we did that every, literally every single week. We did for financial services, then we did for manufacturing, then we did a supply chain. So you can very practically use this and saying, all right, where is our target audience? What's working for, for them? Oh, we are really good at healthcare. Bring the healthcare CMOs together if that's the target audience you're going after or that industry you're going after and create a safe place for that. That will help you understand if you understand their problems really well, you be, be a really good listener on it and then start creating content that will bring them into a community that drives that engagement forward. These are very simple things to do, but all it takes is true empathy for your customer. And you got to know who your customer is. Yes. Uh, that's fantastic advice, Sangram. I really appreciate you joining us today to talk through two great strategies to be used, some of the underlying technology that's making it all possible and ultimately really thinking about that smart growth that comes when you do focus on your customers and generate net revenue retention. So well, I'm excited. I'm glad I was, I was part of your first show and excited for people to, to really look about go to market, not as something that, oh, it's another phrase uh, that people have to think about, but that's your path to efficient growth. And I hope people take it seriously. Absolutely. And if you do want to learn more about what Sangram and team are doing, check out Go to Market Partners. And uh, sounds like the roadshow is picking up steam. So join them in a local uh, venue soon. Thanks, all. Thank you.